Hello everybody, welcome to the stream. It is very early in the morning here, um, but uh, it is not very early in the morning where Max is, so uh, thanks for joining us, Max. Thanks for having me. So we're going to talk about uh, Yimbyism because Max uh, wrote a book called Yes to the City, and it is about the Yes in My Backyard movement, uh, which arose in response to the perhaps more widely known NIMBY or not in my backyard movement, which tries to block development and housing. Um, and so I want to get into the details of how Yimbyism emerged, uh, what are its pros and cons are, what are maybe some challenges uh, going forward, and perhaps also the issue of housing more broadly and where this fits into it. Uh, but I wanted to ask Max, uh, by I wanted, sorry, I wanted to ask by starting, I wanted to start by asking you about uh, your research more generally, because you've been researching urbanism for a while, right? Um, so if you could just tell us a bit about like what, you, what you've been researching uh, and how you ended up looking into the YIMBY movement from that, from that beginning. I was always really interested in cities and the cost of living, housing prices, um, and particularly some of the massive changes um, that happened in the past 25 years. I did a lot of research in Eastern Europe where people had to deal with the restitution of, um, of property, uh, private property that was seized. Um, I did a lot of work on tourism, um, which has only become a sort of bigger deal in the past 10 years and with the rise of Airbnb. And I also was really interested in issues of gentrification and uh, the cost of housing. And um, the YIMBY movement really came to my attention because it was talked about um, very quickly in all the major American news sources as a real kind of game changer um, in how people were thinking about neighborhoods and how they were thinking about housing. Um, and that's particularly in the American context. Um, the YIMBY groups, they exist all around Europe and they exist in the US. Um, but I, I definitely was really interested in this as a kind of real challenge to how Americans were thinking about private property, about the kind of sacredness of the single family home. And I, I got very interested in it. So when you say as a challenge to, to private property and uh, the sacredness of the single family home, could you explain that a bit more? Because that just really piqued my interest, that comment. Well, so, you know, YIMBYs are, um, they're a movement that want to change zoning laws um, so that people can build multifamily units on places that are zoned only for single family homes. And that's like 70, 75 percent of most American cities when this movement started um, about uh, 12 years ago. Um, it's changing in, in some part due to their efforts. Um, but really, the way that most American cities look is it's single family homes on a kind of quarter acre lot. And um, that has that has been changing um, quickly as land prices and ho housing prices um, have gone up astronomically. Um, and so, you know, they're not kind of Bolsheviks who want to get rid of private property and they don't want to kind of challenge the idea of of private ownership of homes, but they do want to change zoning laws. And that was seen as fairly radical in the United States and for a UK audience, much less radical because people are used to these things like townhouses, but they advocate for townhouses and for apartments and for making denser housing that's more vertical. I mean, it's interesting in the book, you, you make a comment to the effect that in America, the word cities is sometimes of a bit of a misnomer, right? Because the, these suburbs are so sprawling um, and you, you, you obviously you have a kind of urban core, uh, but most people just live pretty pretty far away right and it's just uh it's not really a city and i suppose that's what you're getting at with the title of the book right like actually americans embracing cities for the first time yeah it's you know sometimes you don't even have the urban core the kind of urban core that we think of as a you know chicago um is kind of gone you know when you get west of the mississippi a lot of those um housing morphologies are all just big sprawling neighborhoods connected by highways with shopping malls and it's pretty hard to pinpoint, you know, where the city core is. Um, and so 
in some ways, we still have an imaginary of cities where they are the Chicago's and the Philadelphia's and the New York's, but they're much more likely to be a place like Phoenix, Arizona, Las Vegas, Nevada, um, that are these big collections of sprawling neighborhoods. And they're not very environmentally friendly and they're not very, um, they're, they don't take uh, land use into much consideration. And um, that's starting to be a real problem. As as a as a European, uh, as Americans would refer to me, uh, I, I it is it is astonishing to me that you would have to drive somewhere to get like milk, uh, in a lot of these places. Um, I don't. Do you know the the show Always Sunny in Philadelphia? Yeah, yeah. There's that there's that episode where um Dennis and Mac move to the suburbs of Philadelphia. I don't know if you know it, and they have they sort of end up with this sort of nightmarish lifestyle where Dennis has got like a really really long commute and max like stuck at home losing his mind and the there's the sort of uh annoying uh neighbor who's constantly saying hello to them and stuff um it just uh it just really reminds me of that um i mean what are in, in on a serious note what are some of the the problems with this type of housing with this way of building cities there's huge problems i mean the first one is that people just shouldn't be driving everywhere and i, I you know i had this experience uh like what happens in the show about 20 years ago i was in denver and my friend said we have no milk for the coffee and i don't really want to go out because the nearest store is a 10 minute drive away and then we have to drive back and get the coffee and so people are living in places that are entirely dependent on cars there's no way to bike there's no way to walk um you know oftentimes there's not sidewalks so that's a major issue um you also have a really bad uh, and non-efficient use of land so you know, for city governments, they have to bring services out to these suburbs and oftentimes they're paying for it. Um, and that's very expensive. You have land running out, so you can't just expand indefinitely as some people basically believed that you could in cities um, like Salt Lake City, Utah or Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and um, you also have the lost wages and lost care time that people are spending in their cars. So that's just to name a few of the problems. Um, that uh, people are really spending most of their life in their cars just to live in a single family home. Um, and the kind of neighborhoods that they're creating are pretty dead. They're places that are just residential. Um, some of them are kind of wastelands at the edge of the city and they're not places that we would think of as aesthetically pleasing or socially vibrant. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I hear all that. I suppose, uh, are, there, are there any benefits i mean what's the why why are, why are americans stuck with this type of city was there any reason to do it is there any benefit that can be spoken of you know there's a lot of um arguments in urban studies about you know how this happened is it sort of a kind of path dependency based on infrastructure and public spending or is it because americans really culturally love a single family home and they have this kind of frontier mentality of they don't want neighbors, they don't want someone living on top of them in an apartment building. Um, you know, some of the benefits are that by having these huge sprawling cities, you a lot of people um, were able to qualify for homeownership, um, largely white kind of middle class people, um, but many, many people are homeowners because they continuously built and there's always the, the, the kind of maxim they have in the US is drive until you qualify, which is if there's the house you want in the center of the city and you can't afford it because you're not approved for the loan, then drive out farther and farther and eventually you're going to qualify for a loan. You know, um, the country I'm more familiar with when we were talking about this just before the stream started is, is Australia. And I, I feel like there's a bit of similarity there um, where my family live in Perth. It was always striking to me that when they wanted a new house, they'd just go and build it in the suburbs. They just There's this thing of, of just going out and building it. I guess that is that kind of similar to the frontier mentality in the USA? Absolutely. And I'm joining you from Melbourne, Australia right now, and I've lived in Australia for seven years. And a lot of it's it's just easier. You know, the, the time and effort that it takes to coordinate with private builders and uh, developers and to finance um, something that's denser and that requires more infrastructure, um, or buildings that are multi-story, it just takes a lot more time. And so if you live in uh, a country with a lot of space, um, it's it's a lot easier um, to build with that kind of housing morphology. Um, but eventually, uh, gas prices go up. It gets very expensive. People don't like living in these neighborhoods. 
some of these neighborhoods develop, uh, you know, unsavory reputations because they're too far from the city or they're seen as kind of derelict. Um, and so there's a lot of kind of problems that have been heaping up because of this kind of development um, that I think now are really coming uh, to fruition as people deal with a number of different uh, issues. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's talk about the the YIMBY movement itself then, because that, that's a good point to start. So I, I actually, being quite an online person i actually thought that it emerged online but it didn't it emerged in in san francisco right as an actual yeah. movement of people in the real world so could you talk us through how that happened yeah so it came about in san francisco which you know before the pandemic the average apartment there cost three thousand five hundred us dollars a month to rent so it was the most expensive city to live in um, just really astronomical prices. And I'm not talking about a fancy apartment. That's the mm. average. So you could live in a really beat up place um, for that tremendous sum of in, money. In the most expensive city in the USA or, or in the world? In the United States. Um, in the world, it's number three or four, depending right. on Hong Kong, Sydney. Right. Yeah. Um, there's a few ways to measure it. You can also measure it um, based on people's income. Um, and uh, so, you know, well, San Francisco is also not a very large city, so it, it has um, uh, not traditionally approved new development, um, and a lot of it is kind of older people who own homes, um, who like the kind of smaller city, they like the city that's only one or two stories tall, um, and they basically told people that they didn't want new developments, and even if those developments were pretty modest, so a block of six apartments, some townhouses, they thought that it would destroy the neighborhood character. And most of the meetings that zoning boards and, and, and city councils held in San Francisco were filled with people saying no to developers and no to architects and making them go back to the table in a very expensive process of um, – of redrawing plans and downsizing the developments they wanted to build. And so this group, the the Yimby group, um, the first ones that emerged, I should say there's a, quite a few of them. There's dozens of them in different cities and they're kind of loosely confederated. They started showing up um, to these meetings and saying, look, we're young professionals. We're, we went to university, we went to graduate school. We, own, we earn over 100,000 US dollars a year and we cannot afford to rent anything in this city. Um, so how are we supposed to live here if you won't build new housing? Um, and you know, San Francisco has a huge problem with working class people living there, it has a huge problem with people who are super commuters, who are you know taking three hours uh, each way on a train or a bus to get to their work. And so this movement really started with a kind of frustration of middle class people, really oftentimes very securely middle class people who said, look, we need a chance in this city. And and um, we're not going to get that chance unless you allow for some new development. Yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned you mentioned two aspects of this debate, which I think are really interesting, each in their own right, and maybe together. One is class, the other is age, right? Um, so so let's talk about class first, because clearly, you and I both agree with the the Yimbies about suburbia um but is there a sense in which they are six-figure income young professionals who are you know coming into cities and advocating the type of housing that might displace uh poorer existing residents yeah so um basically there is the jeopardy of gentrification happening when these developments are built um, but what their argument is, and I think it holds a lot of water, mm -hmm. is that a lot of where they wanted to build were in places that were already gentrified or places that were already quite fancy, um, where you know the house the house has cost two million dollars, um, and they wanted to they weren't going to displace people um, by subdividing a few lots or by gathering a parcel of a few houses. Um, and their presence wasn't going to be that onerous. You know, there's a kind of there's a few more technical debates about certain um, neighborhoods they're operating in. But they basically would say that, um, you know, solving the housing crisis needs to happen on various different different levels. It needs to happen for public housing. Yeah. It needs to happen for private accommodation. Um, and, and so you can't just say um, and, and they would argue 
for a long time, people just said, we need to look after the most vulnerable. We need to build public housing. And that didn't happen on two counts. On one massive gentrification did happen and people had to move farther and farther from the city. And number two, um, public housing was not built. Um, so they said, let's try something different and let's try to build more of all forms of housing. And if we can build more market rate housing, perhaps that will also lessen the gentrification pressures on neighborhoods that are going through rapid economic and social change. Yeah, yeah. Do you do you think that happens? Do you think it does lessen these pressures in practice? Um, I, and then I know you talk about one or two studies in the book, and I've seen, I've seen more emerge. I mean, there was um, the that uh, upzoning that happened in New Zealand, right? Uh, recently, yeah. and and people are sort of hailing that as quite a big success. Um, so, do do you think their arguments hold? New Zealand has been a success. Um, I think that their arguments hold to the extent that increasing the housing stock will eventually lower prices. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that process is really slow. Right. It's not a matter of years, but more a matter of decades. So these kind of measures, like it's not, you know, there's a kind of term that's thrown at YIMBYs pretty often, which is supply fundamentalism, which is that all they care about is housing supply, and they think that will solve all the problems. I think that's a pretty unfair moniker. I think most of them know that supply is just one element and that there needs to be other um, changes made. You know, Part of this is a kind of cost of living crisis, which is that wages are not high enough. Another part of it is that there's been massive divestment in social housing. And so there's a number of things that have to happen to make um, housing prices go down. But yeah, supply is absolutely one of them. I th it's, it's tricky, isn't it? Because, I mean, a lot of the studies um, will find that the supply of housing goes up. And the way a lot of these studies are designed is to try and get some kind of causal effect, which will usually be comparative as in compared to a control group, you know. Uh, and so house prices might go down relative to the control group, but it's it's quite rare and politically very undesirable, I think, for house prices just to go down, as in it, it, you, you don't see that house prices in the Anglo world, and I don't know, maybe across the world, we've bought into this idea that house prices always go up. So just when you were saying, oh, it's a matter of decades, I think w what that is, is, you know, house prices basically have to go up slowly enough <laughs> for a long yeah. period of time for everybody to catch up, right? Because if they start going down, everybody panics, right? I mean, we had that, they went down for a bit last year in the UK, and everyone complains about the housing crisis. But then when they start going down, everyone's like, no, house prices are going down, you know, and it's like, it's this really tricky bind, I think we find ourselves in. I mean, um, I'm not asking you to solve it, but I just thought it was worth mentioning. No, I mean, you know, people are really afraid of that. And because politicians are extremely attuned to a kind of upper middle class constituent constituency, yeah. which is really based on people who are homeowners or even have second homes, um, they're really attuned to housing as an investment. Um, and also a lot of uh, countries, the UK, the US and Australia in particular, have really encouraged people to be over leveraged when it comes yeah. to their mortgages. They've really allowed people to borrow as much as possible. And that's not to say that, you know, there's going to be a 2008 and there's going to be all these subprime mortgages they're going to get called on. It's it's not that. It's that people have really put too much of their equity into their homes. And you also see um, some real problems with the tax incentives that are given um, for whether this is the in the United States where you're not charged tax on your mortgage or um, in Australia where you have negative gearing and you can write off losses on one property on your primary residence. There's a lot of middle class subsidies for housing and, and that's a real problem. So mm -hmm. that gives money to some of the people who need it the least and also encourages them to get really, really invested in property and see it more as a financial mechanism that's going to allow for things like retirement or for a, a larger portfolio rather than use value, um, which people I think would like to agree is a kind of the most socially purposeful use. Yeah, I mean, there's something that struck me when looking into this is that in the UK, certainly, and I think this this probably applies in the in the US and in Australia, right? It's like our, our houses are kind of like a pension <laughs> as well, right? So that that's 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 what we use, that's what we invest in, 
Um, and it just, I think there's, I mean, there's there's an underlying issue there here, isn't there, really, which is um, the public sector, right? Uh, and the public sector arises with pensions, um, but more directly with housing, right? So, I mean, you said public housing isn't forthcoming in the United States, which I, I completely accept as a pragmatic argument. But I mean, to what extent does the YIMBY movement in practice, if not in principle, represent a kind of giving up on, on public housing and giving up on the public sector? Yeah, I mean, I think that they would argue that they're not giving up, but they're letting that form of activism be taken up by different people. So mm -hmm. a lot of them would say, look, we're middle class professionals, we're well educated, and we want to fight for kind of middle class housing. And there's plenty of people who live in marginalized neighborhoods with low socioeconomic uh, outcomes. And we're going to let them focus on public housing, people who are existing residents of public housing. And they would say those things can comfortably coexist. I should note that a lot of anti-gentrification activists say, hell no, they cannot comfortably coexist because at the end of the day, you're going to want to build stuff in neighborhoods that are gentrifying because it's just easier to build there and there's space and you're going to change the, the cultural feel and the demographic makeup of those neighborhoods. Um, so yeah, I think that's a that's a major issue. Um, I also I should say that you know in the United States when we talk about things like housing, um, as you know people are obsessed with it, it's become their pension. I mean, part of that is also because we have a really unaffordable society. We don't have universal health care like the UK. We don't have um, subsidized. I mean, I, I should say in the UK, no one wants to say that the education is subsidized because it's been raised so much. Um, in the past couple of years, but it is still subsidized more uh, higher education than the United States. So people have these rising house values and it makes up for a lot of kind of pulling away of the social safety net in other aspects of their lives. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I mean, there's there's this there's this really there's this much this much deeper issue, isn't there? Um, and just the cost, the cost of living in in the us and having to pay for all of what are often public services elsewhere uh just just puts just puts a lot of pressure on people right yeah um so i want to talk a little bit i'm, I'm trying to <laughs> i'm kind of goading you into being into criticizing uh yimbies but I'm, i just there's something that you said in the book uh, there were two things and you mentioned one of them earlier two things they have a little bit of trouble with or tend to avoid right so one is airbnb and the other one is like corporate um is sort of corporate investment in in uh in the housing sector right uh big investment firms that own multiple houses right so do, do you think that addressing these is really a, a big part of addressing the housing crisis um airbnb in certain cities yeah it has had a major effect um my personal opinion is that airbnb the genie is sort of out of the bottle and that it, mm. the way to solve this problem is taxing um, people who very, very high municipal taxes on people who are renting apartments. Um, there could be a ban on it. I'm not sure how it would function logistically. Um, I think that uh, the YIMBY movement doesn't really talk about it that much because their main focus is people's primary residence. And I think they would say, look, we want to get people into homes. We want to get them. We want affordable rents and we want um, people to have the opportunity to, opportunity to become homeowners. Um, and then there's also a big split in the YIMB movement. There's some people who see YIMByism as just about housing affordability, and they're kind of applying some really basic urban planning ideas. The idea of having denser cities, of better public transportation, more apartment buildings, more green spaces. Um, so in that sense, they're kind of like urban planning dorks who just want to employ what the stuff that architects have been talking about for 30 years. On the other hand, there's some people who are sort of their their problem with zoning and with single family housing is a larger problem 
with rules in general. Their issue is that they come from a more kind of libertarian ethos and they want to kind of chip away at all zoning and all planning laws because their idea is like you get to do what you want to do with your land. And so in that sense, you know, they would be people who would say, okay, well, it's my land, it's my place. If I want to Airbnb it, then that's my right. But I would say those people are actually in the minority within the EMB movement, um, and, and they're not the loudest voices, although some of them have been loud and they've been very much criticized. And I think at times they can also serve as a sort of scapegoat for EMBism because they're kind of like this character from central casting, the kind of like Texan uh, free marketeer who, <laughs> mm. you know, wants to be left alone on their land. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's an interesting question, right? Because it, it, it raises this almost philosophical question of like what it means to buy a house. Like, what do you buy when you buy a house? Because I think most people agree, right? Say you say you bought a house out in the country um and then you know one day you woke up and found out that uh, there was a coal plant being constructed next to it uh i think most people would agree that that's unreasonable it's it's no longer the house you bought uh remote uh unpolluted once once there's a coal power plant next door uh but at the same time i mean i remember um when my when my mum moved into a new neighborhood that um wasn't really that friendly and uh, she painted her front door pink um, which the neighbours didn't like, and they came and knocked knocked on the door and said they thought it was inappropriate for her to paint the front door pink, um, and she responded by painting the entire house pink. Um, but I mean, I mean, that's that's the type of nimbyism, right? That uh, that we don't like, right? So I mean, how do you see this this issue of zoning, and how do you draw the line between these two? Your mom sounds awesome. I feel like she would, uh, <laughs> she'd be a great sort of housing protester. Um, you know, I I think that. A lot of people would say that zoning started for some very practical reasons. Um, they were environmental in nature and about public health and safety. Um, and then some people would would go say that in certain places, it's gotten a bit out of control. And there are places in the U.S. where there are local codes about, um, you know, you can do this and that with your house. You have to have this color. Um, some of it's in places that are historic districts. Mm -hmm. And so there is a kind of mandate to keep the places as they looked and to kind of respect the historical legacy. But other places are just that's their aesthetic choice. And they came together as a local council and passed that rule. And so they can come to your mom with the order that says, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, these are the uh, prohibited colors and pink and purple are on the list. So, you know, paint your house back to white. Um, so. I think that there's a frustration with that. Um, but I think that most people are, um, are, are mostly coming at it from a more practical point, which is that it's not really about nitpicky neighbors. It's much more about a lack of planning in general. And so a lot of the people, you know, they actually want more planning. They want more planning and they want more organization of cities. They want they want better thought going into the built environment where it's not just like someone comes and builds a kind of like 1950 suburb where there's a couple thousand houses that all look the same. Um, they want better quality construction and they want construction that is is more interesting and, and also easier to get around. I mean, yeah, it's, I think it's, it's this is one of the many problems with libertarianism, right? But, it, you know, it's always planning. It's kind of just uh, planning for, for whom um, and uh, is it all above board and does it serve the, the local community and a, a general social purpose, right? So I think one of the things about certain brands of nimbyism is that you, you, you get this arbitrary power of just the, a few nearby neighbors and you're not you're not bringing in you're not bringing in necessarily town planning experts you're not bringing in uh communities who can't afford to to, to live there or prospect prospective communities right um it just becomes a sort of a a, a private tyranny yeah absolutely and i think in the u.s it's also um particularly pronounced which is that a lot of this responds you know, I think that it, the, a lot of it responds to the history of, of, of racism in housing, where, you know, there were places that were that had, um, you know, practices amongst real estate agents who would not sell um, black families, uh, Jewish families, um, sometimes even Catholic families. Um, 
in in certain areas um, for up until the 1950s and 60s. Um, so in some ways, I think there's a real connotation of racism when people talk about nimbyism or some forms of nimbyism. There's also a level of classism. You know, some of the people said that, um, you know, we don't want when they were talking to uh, city councils and zoning boards, they would say, you know, we don't want apartment people in our neighborhood. And so they would say, you know, it's going to be too many cars and uh, too many um, people in the public school and there's going to be apartment people. And the real question is, well, what do you mean by apartment people? And I think that it's not so subtly that people don't want poor people. They don't want people who can't afford to buy a house. Um, and part of the kind of heavy lift, and this might sound crazy in the UK, is that the heavy lift that some YIMBY groups have to do is convincing people that they can be middle class and have kids and live in an apartment and it will be okay and that they'll have a nice quality of life. And um, part of, the, you know, we don't have a great housing stock in the U.S. of apartments in some cities. So there's not a lot of examples of what it looks like to live in a nice apartment building. Um, but also some people really do have um, an issue with with that life. And, and so, you know, trying to sell people on it is a major endeavor in, in a number of cities. It's interesting because despite you know looking into this and and understanding the the racist history and the arbitrariness arbitrariness uh, of uh the the single family suburban home when i think about like growing up and and having a family it's that image is still in my head right it's like i would be living out in the suburbs uh i wouldn't i wouldn't be living in in the in the city is it, i think it's a very powerful narrative and I, I expect it's even more powerful in the usa to be honest and there's just no denying that there are class lines and there are race lines for this um i mean there's a there's a comedian on youtube um i forget his name finley christie where he goes around asking people in london you know do your uh do your grandparents have a house in the country? And almost every white person says, yes, of course, you know, yes, of course I go there, you know, I go there every summer. And then every, every, almost every black person is like, no, they live like just down, down the road from me. You know what I mean? In, in an apartment. So yeah, I mean, it's just, it, it's a really powerful uh, narrative that is just very racist and classist at its heart. I should say, you know, the U.S., it's not just about living the good life. And, you know, I want to go like play croquet and, and drink pims in the country. It's also people have a real imaginary of having a defendable space, you know, having mm. private property. It's like they want to have their backyard, their front yard. I mean, it, it's a reason there's a reason why stand your ground laws are American, which is that <laughs> deep in the American psyche is this idea that you need a defendable space and that you're going to be, um, if you have to share with other people or be too close to them, that that's really dangerous. And I think that's really eroded our sense of trust. And there's a real problem where people are from neighborhoods where they don't have many social interactions, they don't have many public places, um, and they've just individualized everything down to the family unit. And you can see that level of distrust playing out in American politics in really pernicious ways. It's just uh, get the hell off my lawn, isn't it? Basically, it's like that. Absolutely. That thing. <laughs> yeah, there's so many places you go. I think you have to you have to visit the U.S. and 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 people are are gassed and they see the signs of you know don't come on my lawn, I'm armed. Um, and I, uh, it, it's they, just they think it's a joke, but it's not. <laughs> Americans, like I know most of my listeners and audience, and you, you know, you you think this is absurd, but I just to communicate how absurd it is to almost every other country in the world. I I find I find it impossible to communicate it. Like I, the idea that you would be, <laughs> you would have like a gun to deter intruders from your from your home that's like out out somewhere and that's like your castle. I just it's just it's just so weird. Like and and really unique to the US. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know why I'm laughing. Maybe it's like laugh laugh or you'll cry kind of thing. Yeah, and there's a lot of paranoia. I mean, look at all mm. the kind of movies for the Hollywood producers about. Uh, home invasions and you know having to arm yourself to the teeth like it's a it's a big part of of the American culture to have um, to have a house but you know at the same time you can have the nicest house in the world and it can be really isolating living that way if you're living in the state of fear if you're living you know you can have a beautiful six bedroom house but if you think everyone's going to attack you and you have to you know p patrol the perimeter of your yard that's not a great way to live. <laughs> No, no, uh, it, it's 
it is incredible i mean i i just yeah i i don't know how to address it it's so it's so deep seated um i mean let let's let's talk about cars a little bit because i think you mentioned them earlier and i wanted to talk about them a bit more and it's part of this whole vision isn't it because there's the whole uh, i don't know if you know the fuck cars movement which yeah. is kind of adjacent to the yimby movement right and you when you were describing the problems with with american suburbs you were really focused on cars and the commute um and so and at the same time it seems that these same people who have this castle mentality the car is a massive part of their view of of, of freedom and you know being out on the road and stuff so i mean to, to what extent do you think this this is a kind of fuck cars thing the the uh the yimby movement yeah I, I do think that for sure it's a it's a fuck cars um part of you know wider movement there's the the war on cars and there's all these things happening you know people look at the kind of environmental costs but also the economic costs of having to drive absolutely everywhere and having no choice um, having to pay for parking, find parking, it's a huge drain. And it really, you know, um, having lived most of my life in New York, I, I'm, I really love not having to drive. And I, you know, I, I, whenever I go somewhere else, you know, you have to think about, you know, well, I can't drink at dinner. I, I can't, um, like I have to plan on parking. I have to do all these things. And so it is a, it is a really, um, it is, it is a big problem, you know, and also, um, trying to plan for parking, trying to make building codes um, that have parking incorporated is very difficult. And so, you know, for a long time, when they were building apartments in most American cities, they had a minimum car uh, number per apartment. And it usually wasn't two, it was more, or sorry, it usually wasn't one, it was more like two. Um, so that involves a lot of extra costs for developers. So even if you get people to live in an apartment, even if you convince them to live a little bit more of a contained life, a little bit more of a pedestrian life where they have a car, but they don't use it all the time, the building codes would actually mandate you to put in structured parking. And that increases the cost of development exponentially when you have to build some sort of structure um, or lease out parking. You've got the the houses that take up too much space for not enough people and then you've got the cars that <laughs> that sort of almost double that right and you, you have to devote loads of loads of uh, space in cities to to car parks or, or parking spaces and that means wider roads right and then you've just got this this horrible cumulative effect where you're not fitting that many people you know in, in each in each area of land uh plus pollution um and all the problems that leads to um plus the fact that like i don't know i mean maybe this is just personal preference uh, i understand the idea of like going on a big drive on on one of the big american roads i think that would be pretty cool but in practice that's not what driving a car is like especially no. in a city you're just stuck and it's horrible and it takes ages and you get yeah. road rage and like it doesn't get you to where you want to be and famously i mean going back to always sunny right famously the commute uh is 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 something that almost everybody hates so i don't understand there must be some kind of cognitive dissonance here because i'm sure that the same castle mentality people would acknowledge that they probably hate their commute and being stuck on the on the freeway but somehow it's a part of their freedom well you know everyone this is this is something that we've all kind of growing up in cultures that fetishize cars we have the kind of like commercial version of driving through new zealand in like a beautiful mountain road and it's just you whereas really you're just breathing exhaust um, on your commute <laughs> um, and similarly you know we've also sold people massive suvs that are now the norm um, as if they're going to go off-roading every weekend. And really, they just bring them to the supermarket. And it's a kind of, you know, race to us all driving tanks in some ways. And, yeah. I, you know, this is something I, I've thought about a lot, especially here in Australia, where you see people driving bigger and bigger cars, which is that if other people do it, you don't want to be the one poor schmuck who's driving a little VW Bug and everyone's driving some kind of massive Hummer mm. or Range Rover alongside you um, because you're going to feel really vulnerable and you will be very vulnerable if you get into a into a wreck um so yeah that that's a big problem when it comes to planning um we have really planned our cities around cars um and it's really hard to to make that change and that's a change you know people feel really vehemently about um here in melbourne also in new york there's been massive 
anger at trying to put in just a couple bike lanes. And, you know, you look at all the space dedicated to cars, whether it's parking them or driving them or, you know, auto body shops, the uh, car dealerships, and there's a little tiny bike lane that's like a meter wide and people are absolutely apoplectic about it. Um, and, and there's something about that that really, really ticks people off. Um, part of it has to be class, I think. I mean, more and more, um, and this is something Yimbys really encounter is that they're arguing for people who uh, want to live in the city. They want to live in apartments and some people won't have the opportunity because it's just going to be too expensive. And they mix a kind of economic um, uh, indignation because they have to live farther out of the city and they um, and they can't access a lot of the kind of things the center city has to offer with the kind of cultural um, animus as well, which is they're angry at the people who bike. They're angry at the people who can walk to the to the store. And and the two things are kind of fused together. And it's it's hard to disentangle them because you know people are pissed that they have to live a uh, two hour commute away. And and they do resent people who are who are urbanites. And I, I see that. I don't know how to change that mindset. I don't think. I mean, I, I don't know if you've been to. Um... Copenhagen or Amsterdam are the two two cities that spring to mind, uh, which are heavily built around bikes. And I think, I mean, they're different. Uh, Copenhagen still has quite big roads and there are cars. They just aren't that many and they're a very, very well, um, uh, well, big, big and uh, uh, use, useful, uh, for want of a better word, cycle lanes, right? They're everywhere, right? You could, They're easy to use. Um, Barcelona's kind of similar, actually. Uh, Amsterdam's more it's just cycling there's there's just cyclists everywhere they ride past you and uh you know they ride sort of among the pedestrians right but i think in both of those cities copenhagen and amsterdam there are more uh bicycles than there are people right and you just you can't go there and be like oh well this is a horrible place you know nobody's free here uh nobody can get around you know what i mean they just they're really really nice places uh people <laughs> people are just much happier in that kind of like pedestrian centric uh cycle centric and you know um multi multi uh story apartment environment right uh with you know commercial and uh residential buildings and uh you know all other types of buildings together it's just it's just an unambiguously better place to be compared to would you use the example of phoenix arizona which is just sort of a, a urban yeah. sprawl yeah people i think there's a problem which is that a lot of people they don't want to they're they're wary of public spaces whether it's for crime or they're just like you know the last time they were on the tram some dude was like playing their like TikTok at the top volume and on their phone and it really pissed them off. They want to kind of control their whole that space. That is annoying. Like, but yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I love I love the Amsterdam um example because they've done such a good job at not just at the inner city, but the entire city and all the Netherlands, like linking it up with public transportation, long distance bike routes, bike routes for all different kinds of neighborhoods. And um and you know, people always say, Oh, how do they do it? And I, I say, well, look, if you've ever been there, unless you're there in like August, it's like cold and windy and there's a North Sea breeze. And if they can do it, then here in Australia, like, what are you complaining about? Mm. You know, it gets to like, it's it's barely cold here. And um, and the other thing is that, you know, the when people say, oh, but that's in their DNA, they've always been doing it. That's not so. If you look at Amsterdam in the 70s, it was filled with cars and there was a big um, campaign called Stop the Child Death or something, um, Stop stop child murder um, because a lot of kids were getting hit by cars and they pulled the cars off the streets and they got rid of a lot of the highways and they put them onto ring roads um, outside of the city. And so it solved traffic problems as well, which is that um, if you want to drive, you can go along the ring road mm. and get places faster. But most of the city will be reserved for pedestrians and bicyclists. Mm. Imagine having a problem where people are being killed and then passing uh, laws and devoting resources to solving it uh it's something as an american i, I think, cannot imagine that no, that's I, beyond my uh, yeah <laughs> in the uk we might pass a law but we won't give it any resources um <laughs> but uh so i guess it's slightly better over here but not really um so so while we're on the country of europe there's somebody in chat who's very keen for us to discuss vienna um because they they have one of the more successful approaches to to housing right in in the world i think and uh so could you talk us through that a bit yeah, so Vienna has a really um, extraordinary public housing program. 
Um, it started with the socialist governments um, in the interwar period, um, in the kind of red Vienna period, um, and, and they've never um, stopped investing in social housing. Um, and so they've done a really great job um, keeping that as a, an avenue for all different like class levels. So they've done a lot um, with refugees and new migrants, but they've also provided um, some social housing for people who are quite middle class. Um, and it, it's a great model and it shows you that, you know, just building is not going to be a panacea um, for these kind of issues. Um, and uh, yeah, I think I think Vienna is a, a really excellent example. Um, there's been some problems with people buying or renting houses off the kind of traditional marketplace, um, but it also shows you a lot about what you can do when a city is determined um, to have some ideas about inclusionary zoning, some ideas about rent control um, that allow for a kind of middle class city. So in not just Vienna, but a lot of German cities, um, there's been a really concerted attempt um, to allow people to be lifelong renters as well. Um, so it's not yeah. that advantageous to buy. Um, and there's some real um, uh, tax and um, and other issues um, that make it so so long term renting is prioritized. And that, that's a really interesting um, policy experiment and something that I think the UK and the US are really loath to try, despite the fact that it's had some some great um, uh, some some great results. I mean, Germany is a really good example of what we were talking about earlier, right? Because like you said, it's like the rental contracts are virtually permanent. There's there's rent control, um, so they can't go up too fast. And the net result is that the average German renter is probably about as secure as the average uh, UK or US homeowner um, with, yeah. with a mortgage, I should say, right? It's like, you know, you're paying money in every month and it's pretty difficult to to get you out um especially as long as you keep paying and i just the, again this it comes back to this idea of ownership right and i think this is a this is something which does emerge from your book right because you're while the yimby movement is welcome for all the reasons we've spoken about um you're, you're you seem quite keen on challenging these these notions of private ownership of housing right and moving towards maybe public housing right um which has been successful in 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 a number of countries you've got um you've got you've got vienna you've got uh germany you've got uh, a lot of the scandinavian countries in finland they just give people uh houses if they're unhoused uh which is a really successful approach who would have thought um and um but there's i mean there's other initiatives right and i wanted to ask you about um things which fr from what i remember and correct me if i'm wrong you only kind of mentioned these in passing but there's think community efforts right community land trusts uh housing cooperatives i think they've been quite successful in switzerland um housing co-ops also and and sort of land back movements are, are successful in poorer countries as well right so in in, yeah. in brazil there's these uh these groups which uh claim land and there is a provision in the brazilian constitution that says property has to serve a social purpose or something to that effect so they use that to claim vacant land right and they can then build housing and and, and build communities there um so i mean to what extent do you think really addressing this housing problem might might mean moving away from current notions of private ownership of housing and towards perhaps more communal ones whether public or, or you I, know, I think that's up. a big part of it i mean i think having a uh, viable social housing is more and more important um for a variety of reasons one is the kind of long-term inequality we see in places like the uk and the us um, another issue is that a lot of places are going to have major problems with climate change, and there's going to be a lot of housing that's going to have to be demolished because it's too close to the sea mm. or it's in floodplains. And so, you know, the the state might be in the business of supplying housing for a variety of reasons and, and not just um, poverty. Um, I think that there's also some more iterative things that can be done. So right now we've done everything possible to emphasize that people should put their money into housing and housing should be a kind of uh, something that's that's invested in as a financial vehicle. Um, and, and we've structured our tax systems in the US and Australia particularly, and the UK to some extent, to really encourage ownership, unlike continental Europe, where ownership has been de-emphasized um, by pretty easy policy mechanisms like taxes. 
And um, people, you know, some people have trouble getting their head around social housing conceptually. And they think, well, I would never want to live in that kind of housing. Um, and they can barely accept to have social housing in a mixed income neighborhood. But it doesn't have to be those kind of changes. It can be other kinds of changes in tandem as well. So it can be things um, that are really simple, like lifelong renting. Um, and and mm. people would say, oh, my God, but what will I do if I don't have um, you know, my money in, in my house. And and the answer is, well, you'll be a lot more mobile if you want to move to a different city for a different job opportunity. So that's one good thing. And you can also put your money into an index fund or any other kind of asset. Mm. Um, there's no reason why we should be so tied to housing. And if you look at it as an investment vehicle, historically in the long term, it hasn't been the best, the best investment. It's been more use value. It's only in the past 25 years that it's been, everyone thinks that it's this amazing thing that it's so much better than any other kind of investment. Yeah, and I mean, you know, you you, you kind of alluded to the, the crisis, uh, the 2008 financial crisis earlier, right? But it, you know, this, housing bubbles are a thing right and <laughs> it's one part of investing uh so much into into housing uh both it, both economically but also politically right it, it's 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 an asset it can be very unstable uh depending on the banking system banks can do some very uh funky things with with those mortgages right and uh, yeah it just doesn't seem like a sustainable basis uh for a social support system and, and you know all the other questions we ask of it and, and talk about the 2008 bubble it's really a case of um, construction companies and banks and developers building housing for the sake of um, increasing their portfolio rather house than housing that was yeah. good housing or housing that was really needed in the areas where they built it and you can see the same thing happening in china right now which is that places you know the, certain financial systems get absolutely obsessed with the property sector and they over invest in housing that's unneeded um, by virtue of either its quality or where it's located and that was you know a lot of the the biggest shocks that you saw in 2008 were in the market of, of places that were just building housing to build it and keep selling it and selling it and selling it but it was in you know the far reaches of suburban in las vegas it was in these kind of um ghost towns in central Spain um, or in housing estates far outside of Dublin. Um, so, you know, the, like the, that sort of shows the, the, the tragedy of financialization of housing rather than mm -hmm. seeing who's using it, where is it needed, what jobs is it serving, um, and how can we make a kind of neighborhood rather than letting people just profit from, from continually building it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, there's, there's private ownership is one thing, like, as you implied, I can kind of make my peace with like, private landlords who were subject to heavy regulations, like in Germany, right, uh, where it just is a source of stable housing for a lot of people. Uh, but I think the credit system and the financialization is actually, perhaps more of a villain in this. Um, and it, it just I think, I mean, Josh Ryan Collins, has spoken about this. I'm not sure if you're familiar with with him, um, but his uh, the the credit cycle in housing and where you know you just lend you lend and then the house prices go up and then the, you have to lend more to to, to people to buy them and uh, that that's part of I think what what's driving this right and uh, I mean I don't know to to, to return to theme <laughs> is this something that Yimbies that Yimbies talk about or is it something they maybe don't emphasize enough? I don't think they emphasize it enough. I I think that. Um... You know, a lot of um, a lot of where they're based are sort of large, successful cities where they're selling um, properties to individual owners for quite high prices. And so there's a kind of face that goes with the apartment. Um, unfortunately, what you see is a huge buy up of single family housing, residential units um, and subprime units by massive landlords and um usually who administer it quite badly um, and try to get as much profit as possible for their shareholders. Um, so that kind of prop tech world is quite scary. And, you know, it's gotten to the to the extent where like using some of these technological tools, you really can just have a kind of algorithm that sorts out this is a good price to pay for this house and we're going to add it to our portfolio of thousands of homes. Um, and I don't think that's going to serve 
uh, renters or or uh, very well. No, no, absolutely, absolutely not. And uh, well, I mean, it goes back to there's private ownership and there's private ownership, right? Uh, there's your sort of uh, retired uh, landlord who who maybe has a history of uh working in the construction sector uh my dad springs to mind actually right and it's like and then there's like these these massive sort of multinational companies that are just yeah. sort of building for for their portfolios as you said and they're growing that's the scary thing which is the, yeah. the latter is growing the former is not yeah absolutely uh, I wanted to ask you about something um which we have we have only really touched on and maybe it hasn't been mentioned at all but uh the green belt uh because so the green belt uh, is for anyone who isn't familiar with it is just like a designated ring around the city uh, that you're not really allowed to build on um, certainly not very much and maybe nothing at all and the idea is that it's green right it's uh, it's countryside it stops the city from expanding um, in into the countryside and you know blighting the landscape and uh, you know destroying the environment and all the rest of it um, and now you know the green belt is something that I always find that the 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 zoning debate is is very complex and uh, it it kind of um you have to drop a lot of your preconceptions because when I hear green belt my inner environmentalist says yeah that's a good idea right you know like uh, you don't want the city to go on forever you need the you know countryside um so why not but I've not met anyone who works in <laughs> urban planning or adjacent to urban planning who thinks that the green belt is a good idea and you use a really interesting example in the in the book which was just uh, so fascinating to me which is the town of boulder colorado right which just seems to have had an absolute nightmare with with nimbyism and, and the green belt yeah boulder is a town it's about a hundred thousand people and it's been about a hundred thousand people for 40 or 50 years um it's a university town really highly educated in this beautiful place um right next to the rocky mountains uh, outside of Denver, which is the largest city in Colorado. It's about an hour away. And it made a green belt in the 1960s and 70s. Um, and that green belt was to limit suburban sprawl. And it was a great idea. And it follows in this very honorable British tradition started by Ebenezer Howard in the early 20th century to make these kind of containers and, and make sure that cities didn't sprawl. And unfortunately, what happened is there wasn't really the power to administer this on a regional level. And so the cities just jumped over the green belt and created new cities outside. And so Boulder has the most bike paths of any city in the United States. It has amazing hiking and it, um, it, it has this green belt that has really bolstered property prices to huge levels. It's, you know, about the average house price there is about a million dollars now. Um, and so it's completely unaffordable for any kind of middle class or working class people who live there and they live um, outside. They live like, you know, a 40 minute hour long commute in one of these satellite cities on the other side of the green belt. So the kind of sad irony is that it's a very environmentalist town, but everyone's driving back and forth uh, with no real public tr transportation to um to the other side of the green belt driving um, across in, the green belt right it's yeah, like driving across yeah. the green belt both ways <laughs> you know it has it, it's provided a lot of good things um in terms of access to community agriculture because some of it's leased to agricultural land um there's tons of hiking and there's some other things and you could say the same about cities like adelaide in australia that has a green belt or london or well in Garden City. There's a lot of places that have these green belts and they have really nice parks. Mm -hmm. But the issue is that they're not actually using them as they were intended to kind of control sprawl. And a lot of them also have sort of derelict areas where, particularly London, where nothing's really going mm -hmm. on there. And there's a question about, well, why couldn't you build there? Um, to relieve the housing crisis. And that's become a really tricky issue um, in London, um, in Toronto, and a number of different places. Um, and I think part of it is sort of letting go of this idea of like that, 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 there, that it still serves its original function. Um, and Boulder also has the real problem, um, which a lot of YIMBY people talk about, which is they don't really want to see themselves as a city. So there's a lot of places that say, we're just a small town. We're just a kind of cute little community. 
Um, we're not a, we're not a city, and 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 we get to stay as we are in perpetuity, and that just can't be the case. Places change; they need to let new people in, and they can't just stay the same. And oftentimes, that kind of inaction creates really negative outcomes because by not planning and by saying no to everything and and not sort of imagining a future, people just let things happen, and when and that causes a real chaotic form of development. Exactly. I mean, this is what we said earlier, right? It's like, no planning is still planning. You're just planning badly. <laughs> and if you exactly. if you just like leave it to the whim, because people are going to move around, right? Um, I mean, it, you know, it, it, stri- it strikes me as, as related to the immigration debate, although we don't have to go into that. But like people are going to move around a country, right? People are going to move into a country. You can't stop them from from setting up somehow from building somehow as long as you want a sort of remotely free country unless you've got a complete uh dictatorship right or a totalitarian state even right so so you you have to make sure it's above board and you can protect the environment that way right you can allocate green spaces i mean london's pretty the green belt in london is a massive problem like you just said right and um there's a guy called mark pennington who wrote his phd thesis on this um do you know that you're nodding profusely yeah yeah Yeah. it's it's, it's really good it's really good um on on yeah the and i think that's our main problem in the uk actually we we have the suburban thing but i i feel like you know we've got is there's always a shop nearby right and there's there's sort of uh multiple uses almost anywhere you go but i think our big problem in the uk is like the green belt um and it really it really inhibits things um but you you can have green spaces london interior the interior of london has green spaces the british countryside is still massive and i'm pretty sure the statistic or the fact is that the green belt has actually been expanding over the past uh the past couple of decades uh in the uk while the housing crisis has been getting worse and i'm like okay well in terms of my balance between countryside and city you know i think i think we're on the the wrong side we've got too much countryside which isn't a sentence i like to say out loud but it's like um it's just a it's just an unworkable idea the green belt um and the clues in the name right you're you're strangling you're strangling the city it was meant to be an emerald necklace that protected the city from from sprawl, but it hasn't worked out that way. And unfortunately, you know, you really have to consider what use value people are getting out of the green spaces and making sure that it's really good. And, and what's happened in London and other cities is when you limit growth in that kind of arbitrary way, what's happened is people just go past the green belts and they build what they want and yeah. they they don't have as efficient land use as they should. Um, and that's happened in most cities. And I think that I think that the kind of tide will start to change on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. Uh, I do hope so. Um, so, I think there's. Well, actually, no. Let, let me ask you this: Have you? So, I wonder what, to what extent this is related to kind of high modernism. So, I keep asking you if you're familiar with things, but do you know "Seeing Like a State," the book by um, yeah, James C. James Scott? Scott? Yeah. Because he talks about this, and when I think about the green belt, I think about the kind of garden city, and the it's a very imagined vision, isn't it? You know, or there's there's the city in the middle where we say it's going to be, and then all around it, there's this kind of this this protective uh, green belt or emerald necklace, as you called it, right? And I think, I mean, do you think the almost everything we've talked about, right, and the issues with planning, do you think this is this is partly a product of of this kind of high modernist planning that's very top down and and you know contrast with Jane Jacobs for instance who you reference in the book who was very much a bottom bottom up vision of how the how the city should work i appreciate that's a very big question no yeah you know i think that uh the kind of like loose organization that jane jacobs um proposes um where you know you just let things function organically there are sort of little bits of libertarian thinking within mm. Jane Jacobs. I know it's a heretical thing to say for someone who loves urban urban planning. Um, but I think, um, <clears throat> and this is also sort of like James Scott's anarchism, which is like, let things happen more naturally. Um, I think that it's been the sort of wrong kinds of interventions in American cities. A lot of it's been interventions that sort of maximize profit um, and and try you know let build, people build as much as possible without large scale public outlays of funding. I think that you know when you look at a lot of things that come from high modernism, 
yeah, there's the overreach. There's the kind of Robert Moses people who are plowing highways through the Bronx. And there's the, um, you know, the massive, ugly kind of brutalist buildings that destroyed a lot of, you know, old historic stuff. But I also think that there is an increased role for, for the state to actually really take planning seriously, um, to have a kind of environmental conscious when it comes to um, to, to to building. So uh, I think the sins of high modernism are overstated, actually. And I think that Ooh. a lot of people now would like more state investment. And I think, you know, the reaction to the 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 massive amount of changes that happened in the 60s and 70s, I think was often like a kind of hands-off approach. And now I think that people are asking for some forms of enforcement. They just want a different sort of priority. They don't want it to be drivers and suburban homeowners. They want it to be cities and pedestrianism and public transportation. Mm -hmm. That's heresy on this channel to uh, question anything James C. Scott has said. Uh, but uh, <laughs> no, I mean, um, no, I mean, I, I don't want to repeat some kind of platitude, but like, I guess, <laughs> obviously, good planning is good, <laughs> uh, right? Um, but I, I suppose the the question is whether your your your, your planning is so restrictive. Um, and whether it only makes sense, this is the thing I was getting at with the green belt, right? It makes sense when you draw it as a nice picture in some architect's office, you know, really far away uh, from from where where it's actually going to be built. Uh, but the planning has to make sense to the people who actually live there as well, all right, and bring them in and pay attention to the landscape and things like that, right? So it's just, I think a lot of the problems with high modernism were this this very superficial aesthetic beauty. Um, which didn't account for the um, the actual reality of, of of life and of of buildings, right? And uh, I I don't I wouldn't I, I certainly wouldn't say that precludes planning. I mean I'm not a libertarian, right? So um, and again it comes back to plan right, uh, or you'll get or you'll get a, a terrible outcome. But I just think that some of the plans that have been put in place have just been way too top down in the past. Yeah. No, and you get a kind of paternalism of it as well, which is, you know, you look at Brasilia and there's like no mm -hmm. place for any kind of small business because everything's like, here's the cafeteria and here's the place where you go do your laundry and everything is already decided, including sometimes like the furniture inside the houses. And so people, you know, they look at the kind of Mies van der Rohe mm -hmm. or the Oscar Niemeyer and they say, wow, this is kind of an interesting apartment, but these giant straight back chairs or ever these strange concrete ledges they're incredibly uncomfortable and i would like to decide to have like plush cushions in my house because i personally want to like take a nap i didn't realize that in brasilia they actually plan the inside of the the apartments as well that is yeah that is it that's taking it that, to a that new was level. that was a that, that's actually i'm i'm not sure about that but that's a kind of high modernism in general well, right okay have, like, furniture with the you know don't the architect decides everything yeah yeah absolutely absolutely yeah that that's what that's what we want to avoid um so i want to finish uh by asking you a little bit about the pandemic because this is this is how you you finish the book um because i mean you you were writing this book during the pandemic right and it came out in 2022 and it's been a couple of years since then we've nominally emerged out of the pandemic at least people want to forget about it and you say that it had complex effects on the debate at the time you were writing so on the one hand there was the direct fear of the coronavirus um, and its interaction with density the more people the reasoning goes uh, the more likelihood you're going to contract the virus you say that that may not be true uh, given given what we know about how disease is spread but it was a real fear nonetheless on the other hand, people kind of realised how important urban spaces are when they were trapped inside their house for, you know, three months uh, during summer in 2020, especially. I mean, I remember that very, very vividly. Um, I mean, how, how do you think this has developed? How, how, do you think that this has had a lasting impact or do you think that it's just kind of been forgotten? How do you think the pandemic has affected this debate? I think, thankfully, it's not been as long lasting as I was afraid that it might be. Um, you know, I was writing this book from Melbourne, which had the longest lockdown of any city in the world. And so right. I was, you know, sitting in my apartment and sort of wondering, we, we had a curfew and it was a, it was a quite intense experience. Um, 
But I think that most people are kind of willing to, um, you know, put aside their germ phobia and ride public transportation, be in an apartment, be in a movie theater. They're not, it's not a kind of long-term problem. And if anything, I think that perhaps there's been some positive lessons about public health that people have internalized where you see a lot more people now, you know, wearing a mask just on a general daily basis, like you would see in an Asian city, um, just to have like a, a, you know, better health quality. Um, I don't think it's long-term fears. I think the one thing that it may have rearranged, which I, didn't expect and perhaps could be even more profound is the ability to work remotely. And so you've seen a long-term crisis in office spaces in a lot of major cities. Um, you see a lot more people who are able to work from home. And increasingly, you also see people who are perhaps going to try to find other places to work and live that are cheaper because they can, um, they can be completely remote. It's not everyone. A lot of people have jobs that are in person and are very tactile and they can't just be on Zoom all day long. But there are enough people that, that could really change some real estate economics and it could be transnational as well. So, you know, it is possible now to have a job in Toronto and live in Cancun and get your Toronto salary and spend it um, in Mexican pesos for, you know, a, a lot more bang for your buck. Um, so, that could be a big thing. And I don't know what that will look like on the social level. And I'm not mm -hmm. sure it will be a big enough change to affect housing markets. I suspect not. I think people are probably going to want to live in the same cities, the same big, expensive, successful ones. Um, but it definitely will have a big effect on office space, which it already has. And you see um, some, some major rethinking of office space um, in major cities. That's really interesting, yeah. Because that you, you, I don't think you really mentioned that in the book, did you? So that's kind of uh, something that's emerged the ri the rise of remote work since since the pandemic finished. Uh, air quotes, but like, um, yeah, I don't know, I don't know. Is it is it going to? No, I, have should, an I should say, Sorry. San Francisco. You know, they that was a place where during the pandemic, a lot of tech and um, people who were, you know. Uh, had really good salaries said i'm gonna you know i'll, I'll move to montana mm. and rent or buy a house and and stay there and you know some people may have wanted to stay there but most of the companies have said yeah you can't you can't stay there permanently you have right. to come back right and then some of the companies have also said if you want to work somewhere else we're renegotiating your salary because you're not <laughs> making a bay area wage and living in portugal yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Company companies won't like it. Um, and I mean, I was I was yeah. kind of concerned about the social implications of what you said about moving to Cancun. But I just think, yeah, it, it's such a big move that some people might do it. Uh, but like, uh, it seems like it's just not going to be like a, a phenomenon. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, we'll I'm, see. I'm yeah. curious if it is, but yeah. uh, maybe it's temporary. Maybe it's just related to certain ages of people. But yeah. Um, yeah, we'll see. So I think it's still uh, still coming to, to to fruition now. The final thing that you mentioned, which really caught my eye, because I've been obsessed by essential workers, um, essential workers or key workers during the pandemic, because it was it was just this moment, and we've all forgotten about it. It really fucking infuriates me. We've all forgotten about it, but everyone was like, oh yeah, those are the people that actually do the stuff that matters. <laughs> and everybody <laughs> just knew who it was, yeah. right? There's no, I mean, yeah. there, there were some, there were some, of course, there were some questions, there were some blurry lines, but like, yeah, farmers, uh, people who deliver your food, people who work in like supermarkets, right? Uh, doctors and nurses, obviously, uh, th they're all essential workers. And, uh, you know, YouTubers are not, right? And it's just like, uh, it, it was just incredible. Everybody just understood that instantly. Like you didn't even, everybody just would have come to uh, probably a list with like a 90% correlation uh, between the categories of what counts as an essential worker. And now we've just forgotten about that. And in the UK, you know, our, our doctors and nurses and teachers and well, everyone else, uh, are, you know, uh, uh, have faced uh, pay stagnation at best. Um, and you, you suggest something which I, I thought was a great, a simple idea, but great. You said all essential workers should be guaranteed housing in cities in or where, wherever yeah. they work. Sorry. 
or maybe even build them housing, maybe have yeah. like, you know, here's the the hospital and, you know, the public funds as well as like the, you know, if it's the hospital, they construct the housing and mm-hmm. you get to have the housing, you know, in a kind of uh, place that's nearby enough for transportation to get to the hospital. Yeah. And you really value those people. I mean, I think that there's a real level of people being completely infuriated who are working for the NHS as nurses and doctors and, you know, um, and who lived quite far away and had to come by all these kind of houses where, you know, people were working from home and, and, uh, and not doing much. And they were still taking their massive commute. Some places they changed that, you know, it, some people in Australia were, were, who were doctors and nurses were living in hotels, um, right. not just because they didn't want to spread COVID because they were working in the emergency room, but because also they live so far away, it was like, let's get you here, um, you know, closer to your place of work. And what if that was permanent? They also put uh, unhoused people in, in hotels in the UK. I don't know if they did that yep. in Australia too, Huge which was equally, Australia. I mean, good at the time, but equally infuriating because you're like, wait a minute, what? So you can just, you can just give them the spare hotel rooms. <laughs> Why didn't, yeah. well, what are you doing oh, that well, before? We actually can solve this problem. <laughs> yeah. Whoa, look at that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I think, I mean, police in the UK, they get uh, free transport, um, or sorry, I think the Met, uh, at least in in London, they get free uh, use of the tube and I think buses. Um, So I think, yeah, like like those, exactly what you said, like housing complexes, special purpose built, public housing and uh, free transport. And, um, you know, I don't know, maybe there are some other things that we could think of, but providing that to essential workers to me seems to be like the like the way to actually honor them not just clapping um but yeah. like actually actually <laughs> permanently recognize the contribution they make yeah and it, you know if not you're going to get a really pissed off constituency of important people who make society function you know there's so many places like in you know teachers nurses cops who just can't live in an entire city and live in the surrounding city. And they feel totally excluded. Like, what's it like to be in a place like Boulder and, and provide an essential service? And, you you know, none of those people actually live in Boulder. Ditto with Manhattan. Yeah. Ditto with a lot of places. Yeah. And so you're living in a place, you know, you have what's it called on this city's name on your uniform, but you live in a different city. Yeah. So it's like on one hand, I provide an essential service. On the other hand, this city can't stand me. They don't want me to be a part of their community, even yeah. though I'm supposedly essential. So yeah, I think that... Yeah. You got to solve the problem because uh, the, it's there's people who I think will continue to feel really indignant about that. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. And it's not just public uh, ish workers, right? It's I, there was a statistic from the American Trucking Association when they said ninety four percent of truckers uh, quit per year, so only six yeah. percent stay per year, and it just it just boggles the mind. And it's like, and they're like, yeah, we're running out of truckers, and it's it's like, yeah, they, uh, no wonder. No wonder, because they 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 truckers are essential as well, right? They're in the private sector, but they're essential, and they're just treated so poorly. But it, I mean, it all goes back to this. I think to try and round it off with a with a neat little bow, it's like we've been getting at this broader social question, right? The the foundation, the social foundation of the economy, and you know the role housing plays in that, and trying to shore this up instead of relying on housing, private housing, uh, you know and um having it as a pension as well you know just building building a society that actually isn't so dependent on private ownership of housing and and you know what yimbyism is absolutely welcome but i i mean i think i don't want to put words in your mouth but i think that in practice again its principles are are, are uh, broad but in practice it's like maybe been a limit limitation of the yimby debate and we can move past it by calling for this broad these broader social gains yeah that sounds that sounds about all right right to me. I think that I think that's a good way to think about it. I think that they did really important work um, for laying a foundation for that. Yeah, but moving forward is probably a, a, one of the best options. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, so, thanks so much for joining me uh, from Melbourne, Max. Uh, I, I really I really enjoyed this talk. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. All right, see you later.